Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Wanpour in London. In the run-up to major elections here in Europe and the United States, it's clear that Russia's assault on Western democracy continues. In a moment, we'll look at this week's European parliamentary elections, where Russia's disinformation campaign echoes the techniques it used in America in 2016. But first, we take an inside look back at the FBI's actions then. As the Bureau was rocked by the very first evidence of what the Mueller report ultimately called Russia's sweeping and systemic interference on behalf of Donald Trump. At that time, James Baker was general counsel of the FBI and a close associate of its then director, James Comey. He says it would have been a dereliction of duty not to investigate Russia's incursions into the campaign. Now, Baker, though, is the target of attacks by President Trump, who's accusing him of trying to overthrow his administration from within. James Baker left the FBI in 2018. He now lectures at the Harvard Law School and is a director of national intelligence at the R Street Institute which is a conservative think tank. James Baker, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So that's some history you have there, right in the middle of it, sort of being on the cutting edge and then facing the sort of slings and arrows of the current president. So take us back a little bit. It extent the election by revealing those emails, uh, which ended up being much ado about nothing, according to uh, Director Comey himself. Um, you know, President Obama, who had wanted to talk about this but decided not to make it public because he thought that it would he would be accused of a political end run i mean do you think that it it was just all way too politicized something this serious in terms of an attack on national security and the democratic pr process well what was going on inside the fbi was not politicized. We were not interested in politics. After the Clinton matter, we wanted to stay as way, as far away from politics as we possibly could. We were all sick of it, frankly. And we didn't, we don't, people don't go into the FBI because you want to work in politics. And so we wanted to stay as far away from any of that as we possibly could. Looking back, I, you know, I don't know what we could have done differently. It was a very uncertain time. We really didn't know what we were uh, dealing with. We didn't know what the Russians were up to. And so uh, consistent with our practice in counterintelligence investigations in that kind of a setting, you keep quiet and you try to sort out before you do anything that might give an advantage to your adversary. So I guess the obvious question, I know you're no longer there, but how much do you know now, uh, apart from the generalities and on a scale of one to ten, how prepared do you think the U.S. democratic institutions, the election, um, is? How, how prepared is it to defend against another such attack? Well, that's a tough thing for me to answer in terms of a, a quantifying it. I mean, I think from people I've talked to and briefings I've been to or, you know, at conferences and things like that, uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security in the United States is very focused on this. Uh, other elements of the government are as well in the intelligence community, the FBI and so on. It, it really does, though, be, because so many parts of the U.S. government have to deal with the situation, it really does require leadership from the White House and from the president of the United States. And I would encourage the president to really focus on this and make sure that all elements of the government are energized and focused on dealing what is a real threat, as clearly articulated in the 448-page Mueller report. Okay, so I'm going to get to, you just mentioned the president, but before I ask you about what he's been saying about you, let's just play what he actually said publicly over the weekend in an interview, kind of hinting or confirming that, you know, they had taken steps. He had ordered steps to be taken uh, around the last elections. Let's just play this. It's been reported this year that you personally authorized a cyber attack on Russia around the time of the midterms last year in order to stop them meddling in the midterm elections. Now, that's strong action for Is that true? Did well, you I, I'd rather that? not say that, but you can believe that the whole thing happened, and it happened during my administration. But why don't you things? talk about that? Because probably. they don't like me to talk. Intelligence says, please don't talk intelligence. You know, sometimes intelligence is good, and sometimes uh, you look at Comey, then you look at Brennan, and you look at Clapper, and right. I'm supposed to believe that intelligence? I never believe that intelligence. But you know, um, you know, I mean, I guess he went there, didn't he? Obviously, uh, lambasting those who he believes actively have been working against him. And he has you in that as well. So you've got two issues here. Is the president uh, a partner on intelligence? And the other issue is it's very personal for him. So what is your reaction? 
reaction to both of those, including the fact that he's accused you of being part of a cadre of inside FBIers trying to essentially overthrow his administration? Yeah, well, that's just not that's just not true. That's preposterous, ridiculous. I don't know what word can possibly use. The FBI was not engaged in any type of coup, coup or attempted coup or conspiracy or treason or anything of that nature. And had anybody suggested that anything remotely like that, I would have stopped it in some way, either internally. Jim Comey would have never t countenanced such a thing. And if, if it had proceeded somehow, I would have gone to the right authorities to make sure that that didn't happen. That, that's just false. So uh, in, in terms of, you know, dealing with the threat, the threat is serious, and it does require leadership from the president. And so, you know, in some ways we can almost... I'm reluctant to say this, but put aside 2016 and focus on 2020. Obviously, 2016 is important because we need, we, we need to know what they did in order to try to anticipate what they're going to do. But what they're going to do is likely different than what they did in the past mm -hmm. because they're creative, aggressive, uh, highly motivated uh, actors, and they want to do something in the future that will keep us off guard, keep us off balance. That's what's coming next, is what we haven't thought about yet. So have you been thinking about what we haven't thought of? I mean, can you imagine, perhaps, some of the things that they might do? And, I mean, they are very much the masters of asymmetrical warfare. They have a whole doctrine, a whole department in their military dedicated to this kind kind of challenge uh, to the to the United States what can you what might what might they be preparing this time around so I, my I guess a couple of things one is I think they will continue to try to play on the internal differences in the United States uh, that we have you know we have legitimate uh, disagreements within within the United States and people are passionate about those things and I think they'll try to play on those and inflame those to to some degree or another I do worry about the, I guess you would say the large attack service that they have with respect to the vote. Apparently there are 20, I'm sorry, 8,800 jurisdictions in the United States that are responsible for vote counting, uh, collecting the votes and then counting them. And not just, you, you don't just have the systems that actually record the vote, you have all kinds of voter registration systems, systems that tabulate the votes and so on. It's a complex system and it just seems to me that that provides a large opportunity for the Russians or others, quite frankly, to play mischief. They don't have to attack the whole system. They just need to figure out what precincts in what states they want to go after to potentially tip an election or to, or to cause trouble in some way or to cause us to doubt the legitimacy of the election. And that, that last point is probably one of the things that's most worrisome because if they just cause us to not believe the vote count, then that will cause turmoil in the United States. So let's just get back to what I played you from President Trump, who essentially gave a broad hint that his administration, he had authorized a counterattack, a cyber attack on, on Russian entities in this regard. Uh, would that have been a good deterrent? My guess is not, honestly. I mean, I think that's it's, it's an, it's a step. I wouldn't see it as a comprehensive step. And again, I think, as you said, the Mueller report talks about the Russian efforts as being sweeping, sweeping and systematic, right? So very broad and very deep and very thoughtful. And so the response of the United States government needs to be comprehensive. All elements of the U.S. government need to deal with this in a coordinated way. And that, in my experience, takes leadership and drive from the White House, from the National Security Council, to push the agencies to do what it is they need to do to coordinate with each other, and importantly, to coordinate with our foreign partners, intelligence and law enforcement services around the world that are our allies. Because the Russians are not just coming after us, they're coming after all of the U.S. and its allies in an effort to undermine you know, the world order that the Allies uh, established post-World War II. So, so you were there in your role as top counsel until 2018. That's two years into the administration, or about. Uh, what, what can you tell us about how this administration did uh, deal with Allies, as you suggest? I mean, is there a good sharing? Because all we see is sort of, you know, um, a lot of discord and disruption sown between the U.S. And, and its allies. But in this particular vital field, uh, is there the necessary sharing? Yeah, I think it depends at what level you're talking about with, with the government, the United States government. The relationships between the law enforcement and intelligence agencies in particular are very deep, 
and uh, they've been going on for a long, long time, uh, the, the deep and, and long standing. And so those are good relationships. I expect those to be very resilient, uh, and everybody is committed deeply to the mission of protecting uh, our citizens around the, around the world. And so that, that is quite good, I think. You know, the rest of the diplomatic uh, activities and the public statements and so on, I think that is of concern because it, I think it undermines confidence in the public, in the, in the publics of uh, our allies in the United States, how well it's running things, how well it's run internally, and whether it really can defend uh, this, this global order that, uh, that we've had for 75 plus years or 70 years or so. Um, so you mentioned a little while ago the fact that Russia could, you know, doesn't have to hack the whole system. It can go to vulnerable uh, states, vulnerable communities. And what we did find out from the Mueller report, from that unredacted released report, uh, the unredacted bits, is that two counties in Florida were hacked by the Russians. And early on today, I spoke to Tad Deutsch, Representative Tad Deutsch, of Ted Deutsch of Florida, who, uh, you know, spoke about this. And he actually had some, you know, he was cross. He was angry with the FBI for not having briefed uh, these communities about what was going on. Just listen to what he told me. We had a, a briefing, a classified briefing with the FBI last week, and I urged them to go back and reconsider their decision to keep this information at a classified level to prevent the American people from knowing all of the details of what happened in the last election. The reason that's so, so important is because we face the same threat going into the next election. It's imperative that we fully understand what they tried to do, where they were successful, and uh, what everyone needs to do to prevent it from happening again. So, I mean, he's got a point, right? I mean, apparently you knew this stuff was happening and it took several years later for it to be released and for the, the victims to know that, that that's what happened in their election in 2016. Yeah, I can't comment on that exactly in part because I simply don't remember what we specifically knew about that, uh, those counties in Florida. But I do take his point that we need to figure out how to share information appropriately with state and local authorities so that they can do their jobs. Look, we, we have to be careful. We don't want to show all of our cards, especially to our adversaries, the Russians in this case. So uh, we have to be cautious about what we disclose about sources and methods that we collect information about, but, uh, or that we use to collect information. But we do need to make sure that we can disclose relevant, timely, and accurate information to our partners at the state and local level so that they can defend themselves. I, I, so I agree in general with his point, uh, both looking backwards, what happened in 2016, and then what do we expect in 2020? So let's just broaden it out again, because it tends to get very personal with this president. I mean, he's named you, as I, as I said before, and he's named all the other intelligence uh, professionals who he disagrees with. Uh, you have tried to say that you're not going to take it personally. And in fact, you've written and you've spoken about uh, actually not hating and rather wanting to love in, in, uh, in reaction to all of this. And you quoted uh, Martin Luther King um, from his letter from a Birmingham, Birmingham jail. So tell me what you mean and why you felt you needed to put this out into the public realm. Well, I guess on the receiving end of the tweets and comments and so on and so forth, I, I have to confess, I guess I did take it personally in the sense that it, it affected my life. Uh, it's hard to hear. Uh, it's hard to have your family and friends hear this. Many friends came to my uh, defense, and I, that was very gratifying. But it was, it was just very hard to hear. Then I tried to think about, well, what do I do in this kind of a circumstance? How do I respond to this? And other people can figure out how they re want to respond. But the way I responded was, I simply am just not going to respond in, in, with hatred and anger. I, I'm just not, because my goal is to try to figure out in whatever small way I possibly can how to unify the United States, how to protect its people, and how to importantly do honor or act in an honorable way with respect to the people who came before me and who exist you know, today in terms of other people who, who have made even more sacrifices so that I can have the freedom and benefits that I have. So it just seemed to me that responding with rancor or sort of tit for tat, that kind of thing, 
is just not going to help the country in any in any way. So I've just avoided trying to do it. But it's not easy on a personal level. It's not. It's a struggle for me. But I that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. And you did feel moved to quote uh, Matthew, uh, which is in Martin Luther King's letter. Uh, the, po the, the bit reads, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Yes, I'm not, I'm not saying that President Trump or his supporters or anybody else are my enemies, but I am saying that, you know, I, I found uh, Dr. King's uh, letter when I read it that has that quote in it uh, from the Bible, uh, just to be profoundly moving and almost, you know, the words leaping off the page speaking to me as a challenge, not, not as an answer, but a challenge about whether, you know, do I have the capability to respond in this kind of positive and constructive way? Maybe I'm too weak. Maybe I can't do that. But I thought, well, I'm going to try. I'm going to do the best I can with whatever resources I have internally to try to respond in that way again, because I think it will help unify the country, uh, hopefully bring us together to some degree, and also inform the American people about what went on and, and what didn't go on in, in 2016. Yeah, it's a really interesting piece of self-reflection. James Baker, thank you so much indeed for joining us on, on all the ins and outs of this very complex issue.